Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome to the very first episode of Let's Talk Trackmania. A brand new regular, um, uh, regular rendezvous, I should say, a regular, uh, your new regular um, appointment to talk all things about Trackmania, whether it be the game in general, the competitive scene, or anything else related to our beloved franchise. And you saw the, uh, the uh, names right there, but I feel like we should do some presentations. Anyways, I'm Thomas Mengozi, aka G Geek, and joining me are the people that are forming the well, famous dynamic casting duo. And uh, yeah, where side bets are a thing, and where caster scores is also a thing, and everything can go wrong at any minute. So, anyways, you guys have got the picture right now. It is Ida Coldell and Scotty. How are you doing, gentlemen? Welcome. I'm talking about the dynamic duo. The most useless duo in the game, so that's why we have you here to somewhat say what's up here. But yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. I mean, despite us being, as you said, the dynamic duo, I certainly hope side bets aren't going to get involved in this <laughs> podcast, or else it's ruined from the outset. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you. I'm glad to have you here, gentlemen, uh, for this very first, uh, for this very first episode. And yeah, we've got a fair few topics to cover on uh, this first iteration on um, Let's Talk Track Mania. Of course, we are, of course, you know the date now. It is uh, May the 12th, 20, uh, May the 12th, 2020. It is 1 past 9 p.m. And yeah, the three main things we're going to be talking about, uh, slight desync between uh, Idik and Scotty. I'll try to fix that as much as I can. Thank you for uh, pointing that out. Uh, but yeah, stuff that we're going to talk about. So we're going to give a little glance at uh, the 2020 action overall, what we have saw seen in terms of action since the start of January. Uh, and also then we're going to have a, a little bit of a talking point with Scotty, who is going to be uh, talking you through what we're going to be uh, looking for in the new Trackmania game, in terms of what the mood is, the expectations, the fears that some people might have. We're going to have a little bit of a discussion around that. And then Eilek is going to have another interesting subject uh, for us, which is going to be how to improve the casting experience and the casting quality of Trackmania, with some very interesting points made by our resident journalist here. So let me just uh, try to correct a little bit, um, a bit of the desync. So I want you to tell me, chat, uh, is the desync audio coming late or audio coming too early for that uh, for the video feed? That would be interesting to um, to actually. Um, uh, to actually get. Uh, so, hello Malakov, hello Beridok, hello Nekroa, SRK, Yogos, and hello everyone. Ask them to clap. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, maybe a bit of a clap for uh, for both of you guys. Hello. Hello, okay. Easiest to verify. So apparently, uh, is it coming too late or too early? I, I'm just seeing the VU meter and it seems like it's on time, but you guys can actually hear the difference potentially. Uh, some people in the chat for us are reporting that it's coming a little bit early. A little bit early uh, for the audio. Okay, so I'm just gonna add a little bit of a. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Twenty. I don't know. Fuck it. Let's go with fifty milliseconds. Fuck it. Yeah. Off to a good start. <laughs> Off to a good start already. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of cursing here. Uh, I didn't really. Uh, I didn't. I forgot to uh, to take the mature box on my stream, but whatever. So. Yeah. Anyways, I feel like, well, we should get started right away. So we're going to get a few clips uh, along the way for you guys. Do not worry about that. I'm just checking if the scene is ready with everything I need. Yeah, everything is good to go. So let's talk about from chronological order about what went down in 2020. Starting off with something for that pretty much everyone of us around here have casted at some point, uh, whether it be throughout the entire season or at last minute notice uh, somewhere halfway along the line like me. And that is the inaugural season of the Grand League. So yeah, in the regular season of the Grand League, we saw Papu emerging in first place with 289 points. But it was really Carl Jr. who was the, the man to beat. He won, uh, I think he won pretty much all of the steps that he entered in, 4 out of 4. And unfortunately for him, he cannot um, really uh, attend to steps 5 and 6. Uh, once because of an internet connection, if I recall correctly, and the other one because of a planned vacation. And he can actually, it couldn't actually be doing SBC on time. Um, how do you guys actually reflect on uh, that very first season of the Grand League, uh, as well as the playoffs that happened in Lyon with uh, Carl Jr. Uh, finishing the business that was undone last season and taking the title finally? Well, I mean, coming into season one, there was a lot of questions that had been asked coming out of the beta season as to 
if things were going to change, if things were going to be updated or anything like that, and how some different people would perform uh, now that they'd got the opportunity to have a full season under their belt, people like Massa, and of course a lot of new people coming into the, the TMGL uh, kind of scene, so to speak, with uh, Marston, of course, Matt, and players like that, how they would cope in such an environment. So it was definitely an interesting competition to stay invested in from start to finish. I mean, there was a lot of uh, issues and, top, and uh, a lot of uh, complicated questions like, you know, of course, Marson having these connection issues. But overall, I think the tournament went very well. It was very interesting to watch. It certainly kept me and Eric entertained when we were there <laughs> casting it. Uh, th that's for sure. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't say that I disliked the tournament. I mean, I'm, I'm sure maybe some things we might end up talking about about the actual uh, the LAN event finals for it. But I think overall, the group stage went about as well as you could expect. Yeah, if you just look at the group stage and how the results played out there, the two players that I want to highlight, or maybe three actually, and that's the top three from the group stage, Papu, Riol and Aurel. Uh, Papu, of course, being well at the beta season as well, but Riol didn't have too high expectations. Maybe he would be in the top eight, then he end up placing second there. Aurel placing third, so that's also something good. But then if you look at people that might be forgotten now that he's so far away, that were a disappointment. You have the pack who didn't even qualify to the playoff. You have Bren who didn't qualify to the playoff. Both were in the grand final of the beta season. So that's some uh, surprising part on a negative side. And once you get into the playoffs, well, uh, Carl Jr. of course, showing once again that he's the best player in the game. But the guy who then surprised me the most and maybe I'm the happiest about is Scrappy. He finally proved that he can perform at the biggest event in the game and check me in the ground league, it's certainly the biggest event so far, placing a second there, so some key points there for myself. What about you, Geek? What is your biggest takeaway? Well, uh, I do actually join you on the scrappy bit because that's actually a bit of an interesting conundrum because he was actually signed with Existence for the very first two steps of the season and then parted ways with the Spanish organization. And as soon as he parted ways with the organization, <laughs> just like that, the results have gotten better for him. Uh, allowing to get in Lyon. Yeah, a really solid run by uh, the Belgian player to get the runner-up spot in the end at that uh, Grand League season. For me, I, of course, I'm going to be signing a little bit bi biased, uh, but uh, yeah, I was especially sad for Tween uh, and what happened to him in the in his final run in the uh, in the lower bracket. It looked like it was so much, it was looking so good and that he had the place on stage in his hands and unfortunately, a small error ju judgment in the before the final jump on Mini XXL. Remember it like it was yesterday, and that was a full stop pick on the CP that allowed Rio Lu that allowed Orel to actually get tri a triple finalist moment. And uh, yeah, in the end, Riolu prevailed in the final round, and yeah, that was the end of that. Kind of sad, but uh, overall, it was really a nice competition to cast. It was my very first big my move. Those were my, my very first big casts on uh, on the stadium scene, and to be fair, I really had an enjoyable time. And uh, yeah, this connects to something else that has been happening uh, in the parallel to the uh, Grand League. It's been the Open Grand League, which is pretty much open to everyone, and where we saw basically uh, Gwen uh, securing himself a spot in the top eight, but not where we would expect. Uh, he was dominating the rankings up until step number five, where he lost all of his points. In uh, the um, in the first lap on Zeppelin on the identity on the very first Zeppelin jump and uh, yeah he fell in third place but that allowed Afi and Yannick's two Swiss uh, the the two uh, Swiss drivers to uh, top out the uh, the top eight and actually get into the combine and combine was definitely interesting of course we saw Gwen coming out on top on everything winning three out of four phases absolutely insane. And Afi also uh, emerging in second place with a really, really nice shot, uh, with uh, actually securing himself a spot in the next Grand League season. What were your points on uh, actually seeing uh, the young guns take on the uh, the big boys of the competitive scene? Well, I mean, come, yeah, going into the combine itself, it was extremely interesting, especially because of some of the faces who were in the combine, who you might not have expected. I mean your players from years gone past through tech and also ex exactly as Eric was saying from uh, having such strong performances in the beta season uh, you had people like uh, Pac, you had people like Carl Jr. Down, uh, not Carl Jr. sorry, uh, Pac and Bren, pardon wow. me. Yeah, I got, I got the two Solary ones mixed up there. But yeah, uh, the, the, you had really, really big names down in the combine. You had Massa down there as well, which uh, was very interesting to see how 
because uh, the questions were being asked like uh, about players like Afi, players like uh, you know, say Volnera, Yannick, Gwen, about how they would perform because they'd perform so well in the combine, but how they would actually perform against the real top level kind of multi-style players and things like that. And I think they did get the chance for, against some top level multi-style players. I mean, I don't think uh, Pack and such were down there as a result of them uh, not playing well. But yeah, I mean, it was certainly interesting to see how they uh, coped with their issues, so to speak, uh, and how they eventually overcame. And now Gwen and Afi are confirmed as part of the Grand League, and it looks like we have uh, lost Eric. Yeah, we've lost Eric, and he's popped in in your spot, so that's great. Uh, I'm going to have to redo it's that. Be, uh, <laughs> get used to this. Get used to this. Get used to but this. This is the continue. very first yeah. run. A little bit off sync. 20 second, minutes second more deliver. Eric is okay with sync. Uh, thing is, I don't really have a per, um, per uh, partaker source. Uh, we don't have a, your image yet, uh, Eric, by the way. Uh, so we're just going to have to wait for your camera to come back on. I'm just gonna clap. Okay, Scotty is back on. And yeah, we're back with all the same place. I didn't have to change anything. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, we had Scotty's point of view. Did you have anything that you could potentially t tell about the combine, uh, Eric? Of course. Uh, when you look at how we ended up with Gwen winning it, uh, from the moment we had the announcement of the 16 players from the official uh, champion of Grand League, Gwen was the player I missed the most seeing there. I don't even understand why he wasn't in in the end i was explained by softy that he was too young so he just had to perform well in the open grand league and he would eventually be in when he's 16. he will turn 16 before the season two starts so that's not gonna be a problem anymore but the player that surprised me the most in a positive way is uh, alfie and yannex happy to see both of them now getting in yannex uh, recently announced that even though he didn't get top two he will still get a slot so that's good because those three players were a level above the rest in the open grand league and then once you look at the because not forget that two of the players in the Czech Minute grand league will not be in the Czech Minute grand league anymore and uh, coco and uh, rolling getting knocked out there a little bit disappointment to see that uh, thinking about when rolling even qualified to the playoff stage for the beta season coco being a good player by himself but yeah some players have to go get knocked out when others players are coming in and uh, i already believe i have a bet with scotty i think gwen will be top three in season two of uh, Czech oh, yeah. that's yeah, not that's that. not too far of a stretch to actually believe that gwen will be in the top three and of course i mean it always kind of pains me when we lose uh, it pains me as a french as a fellow frenchman to actually lose uh one of the contenders uh from the grand league in uh in that spot but yeah in this case it's more of like a um more of a um, like renewal of uh, of talent. I mean, we, sure, we might lose Coco, who is a really great player. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, he's, he's not vice uh, vice champ, uh, French champion for nothing. But uh, yeah, seeing Gwen, the reigning French champion, by the way, uh, actually come in and have a shot at actually uh, performing on the biggest on the premier st esports stage on the Trackmania scene, I feel like it's gonna be really interesting to follow. The progress of that young man and uh yeah that was a um, overall a really nice uh really nice overview of what could be lying ahead in terms of the uh, competitive scene for um for track mania another uh, event that we're going to be uh, covering briefly and uh where you can actually chip in is uh the from zero to hero tournaments after the and uh, after the cancellation of gamers assembly to the covid 19 moss and his team were con promptly contacted to actually host an online tech tournament uh, reviving the From Zero to Hero moniker and yeah we had a over 2000 euro prize pool 2051 we had a stacked player field with players from the scene such as Carl Jr. Pack, Tween, uh, uh, play, uh, established players playing we've got Bergy also as well coming back to play the solo tech tournament we had Novice who also is in there yeah also our uh, player turned caster midway through the competition scotty was there to actually give uh, to actually uh give uh, give it a shot and uh yeah also we got to witness a brand new uh, dynamic trio so to speak with kappa who unfortunately was not able to attend due to uh, wrist injuries but we also saw like uh yeah that was a really nice turnout overall and uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, your guys' thoughts on that since you got. I feel you got like you guys. I mean, we covered around the same amount of competition, but I feel like you have more of an uh, more of a better insight in terms of uh, how you maybe have a uh, better uh, positive outcome on uh, this one than I do. I mean, it's not that I uh, view the event neg negatively. It's just more. I feel like you can give more depth than me on there. 
Well, I mean, uh, me having been both a player and later, although a little bit unplanned, a caster in it, it <laughs> was uh, certainly a unique situation that the event hosters were put in, and, uh, and they definitely stepped up to the level of quality which we know the uh th that admin team is capable of i mean we had uh, spectacular quality and maps uh it was very well organized and of course everything went smoothly as far as i would see from start to finish but i mean the the real point there is what you were mentioning there uh, geek was just simply what really made this tournament for me was the depth of the field the depth of quality from start to finish was mind-blowing you had almost every player who was uh worth playing so to speak that uh, you could get so counting out the likes of you know karyan frostbill and things like that who's who's well at least who are around nowadays pardon me with the exception of frostbill but you had pretty much everyone you could have wanted to be part of this from the top straight down to the to the mid pack i mean I remember going up to this tournament even wondering who would even be top 64, top, you know, 70, never mind when you're typically going into these events thinking that maybe 32 or 16 of the top placings are the ones who are actually going to be contested. So I think the event went really well. The final stages were fantastic. They had great storylines with the likes of Novus making a charge through, with some players falling down a little bit earlier than they might have been expected. You know, some players, would they do well, would they not do well? And even coming into it, I mean, would names like Harvey Flyer show up? Or, you know, how trained would people like Zach be who have not been in the scene for years? So a very interesting event and had a lot of hype going into it. And I believe it lived up to every bit of it personally. If you just look at the, uh, I believe this is the biggest uh, tech event in the history of the game and so many people coming True. back to celebrate the, the end of the game. I just hope that this doesn't be like, you saw already, I believe Omnipos coming back to play this and then once this event is over, he said that he's going to leave Jack Mina for good. Okay, it's, it's okay to actually celebrate that, okay, this is, was supposed to be the last event, but I don't really understand why people see this as their last event in their career because now we have a new game coming out now we maybe have new chances but that's i guess another topic when we speak about the new checkmania game if you look at the top three those are uh, three of the four finalists from the last really big uh, tech competition in checkmania the checkmania world championship only missing kappa who joined me and scotty for uh, the cast uh really pleasure to be joined by him there uh but this Something to bring up and something to remember is that Pack hadn't had a good 2020. He didn't perform well at Champion Grand League. Yeah. Didn't even reach the playoffs. Now he comes back and wins this tournament. He beats Carl Jr. He beats Twin, and then also a positive surprise to see Novis stepping up, being in the grand final, and actually being somewhat competitive against these players. I didn't believe that he would have a chance, but in the end, he had at least somewhat of a chance. Yeah, that's actually my main takeout from the from the uh, tournament. Uh, one of my main takeouts from the tournament as well. The uh, great the uh, great rebound from uh, Pax actually come back from a poor start to his uh, 2020 uh, 2020 Trackmania campaign, so to speak, after failing to qualify for the playoffs of, G of the Grand League and take the From Zero to Hero title. But also Novis, who actually it was on Siphon Blur, who popped some insane times i mean i was casting with necro at the grand final in french and when he actually dropped the sub 102s in the middle of the grand final we were going crazy i was almost bouncing on my chair with excitement with what we just witnessed and uh yeah we uh he actually gave a good amount of spectacle and uh, yeah i'm uh, looking forward to see what the um what the che what uh, that's young check gun is able to actually bring to the table in terms of uh skill maybe a maybe a uh uh, an opponent and rival to Kappa in the making? Maybe, maybe yeah, not. That's a real question though, because now you see Novis maybe having a breakthrough performance, but he's having a breakthrough performance at a style that the likes of Kappa, the likes of Pack, Carl Jr. and Twin is prioritizing less because Checkmate and Grand League is the biggest tournament. So how do you think that this is actually going to be the last tech event? Or do you think that eventually we'll see more potential uh, big tech events that even brings the likes of Carl Jr. back to the tech scene. That I mean, is I certainly hope not. <laughs> that that is a yeah. that, of course we hope that this uh, we hope not. I mean I'm also hoping in a, I'd also hope not with the uh, other styles as well. I mean if we're all moving to multi style then we kind of lose the variety that really makes Trackmania great and unique in its own way. The fact that you have different play styles to cater to different kind of people and also different competitions and to actually show people 
uh, who can be the best in a set style. If we all move to Moses Island, that's pretty much the end of the game. Closed out. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I think I feel like I got two more events to cover that I'm going to cover really briefly here. And after that, we're going to move on to uh, the next topic. So for this, I'm going to bring the clip scene and we're going to be talking about the biggest uh, team competition that has been happening throughout the uh, beginning of the year. It is the Trackmania Masters Team Cup 2020. Now, here it was pretty much uh, two teams sticking out at the end of group stage. At the end of the group stage, it was Group A with Team Elite uh, going full 8-0. And the other team to have done that is Team Numelops, who have won gone full 8-0 and have actually beaten uh, Elementary's 7-1. Uh, to uh, I can't really remember. I think it was 2-1 two, uh, two to one, uh, already in, um, in the group stage. I don't really have the scores in my head. I'm really sorry about that. And that was, funny fact is, that was Elementary's only loss in the group stage. That was against Numelops. Uh, and Numelops uh, headed into the um, champion's bracket along with Elementary's. And they faced off in the winner bracket final. With Numelops ending up losing that fight. So that was pretty much dead even for both teams. And they would have to face THE in the lower bracket final. THE didn't really manage to make a uh, fight back for... Um, for actually preventing Numelops from getting into the grand final. They lost something like 21-6 or 21-7 in the uh, round count. They uh, won a clean 3-0 uh, for Numelops. And uh, yeah, they went back to the grand final to face off for one third and final time uh, elementaries. And in the end, it was the uh, Numelops squad led, led by Harney, comprised of Zykos, Solia, Mothix and the like that actually went on to... Uh, overcome a five-point deficit since um, Elementaries had five uh, rounds uh, given to them since they come out, came off the winner bracket, and uh, they came back to uh, and uh, Mumulops came back from that to take the series uh, three to one with 27 to 21 of, in terms of round uh, 27 to 20 or 21 in terms of round score as you see the grand final being played on the background to actually claim the title of uh, Team Cup 2020 champion, thus capturing a really successful campaign for the former Team Venture team because the squad was picked up midway through uh, the um, TMM Team Cup to actually become Numelops and uh, yeah, I feel like we're gonna be seeing some great, uh, more great things from the Venture lineup. And finally, last but not least, we had a pretty big, well, a pretty big, we had a really nice event coming up uh, nice last weekend and it was the Full Speed League Glitch Edition. Very much the same case as From Zero to Hero as a replacement for GA, although with a bit of a slower, uh, lower player base, 32 players selected on the qualifier basis. And that was actually my very first um, full speed uh, cast from beginning to end. And that weekend was just phenomenal with the level of play of the players that were actually engaged we had Mudda who was, uh, was actually taking part we had Kid on his last competition on Trackmania before taking a uh, retreat from competitive Trackmania to focus on his studies it was absolutely beautiful to see we also had Darkbringer who was actually in there and uh, yeah the standing of the pl of the playing was insane especially in the winner bracket final we just had the Mudda dropping a new Daddy 1 on uh, uh, on I think it was Bikit who dro uh, he dropped a uh, 42.1, uh, which was the only 42.1 on that same circuit, so truly a mad lad. And in the end, it was a tense battle between Kid and Mudda, but uh, in the end it was Mudda, the uh, Australian Penguin, who prevailed to uh, take the title of Full Speed League uh, Glitch Edition Champion. He took to Twitter to say that it was a bit of a bittersweet victory. He would have preferred winning in Poitiers and seeing a lot of people then winning online, but that's the way it goes with, uh, with the world. You can't really predict what's happened. Kid in the end secured a second place in his final competition, which is a safe way to actually, which is a pretty good um, final result before he head to retirement. Then TK completed the podium with third place. Darkbringer unfortunately was not able to challenge uh, Aurora Racing's uh, uh, player from Latvia, who's now an American resident, to take third place. Darkbringer will have to be content with fourth position. So then, I feel like we've done pretty much a wrap. Uh, we've done pretty much uh, covered everything there is to cover about what's happened in the uh, competitive Trackmania scene in 2020. So I feel like we should move on to our next subject. And for that, I'm going to hand it over to Scotty, who's going to be talking to us about what's coming up with TM3, with all the fears that some people might have, all the expectations, and the general mood around the new game. Thank you very much. So yeah, I mean, one of the hottest topics which has been on people's minds 
uh, the past few months especially, and even over the past few years, is the question of what's been coming next for Trackmania. And the, the question was then answered coming into Leon Esports when there was an announcement made by uh, Hillis along with Zerator that a new Trackmania was to be expected in May 2020 initially. Of course, we've passed that date now. Of course, the clips you can see on screen there were the first that we had then seen of the new Trackmania and the first information we were then getting was all coming from the same announcement at Leon Esports. For any who were not familiar, it was going to be uh, essentially a re-envisioning of the stadium environment. I kind of bring it back up to date, so to speak, as of course, our lovely Mania Planet game has been uh, doing its rounds for quite some time now. I believe 2012, 2013 is when we were first seeing the uh, early uh, builds of TM2, so to speak, in Stadium. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, we're incorporating new mapping changes, as you can see the, the lovely new blocks which were uh, which were teased uh, in, in stream there, retexturizing re things like uh, the, the dirt, uh, make new car models and such, but also some other uh, big changes such as our clubs format, which was being mentioned, and as well originally planned to be incorporated with the upcoming Zerator Cup. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, coming into this with the original planned release date of uh, May the 5th, but I mean, as we saw, unfortunately, that didn't happen. But I mean, yeah, it's it's unfortunate that it didn't happen, but I mean, I guess we could kind of saw this coming a little bit, uh, it, or at least it was definitely a possibility, I think you guys would agree. Yeah, but yeah. if I just bring it up kind of quickly, because they, in the statement, they brought up or posted they said that corona was the biggest uh, reason for this being delayed but do you think that corona is actually the biggest reason or direct reason i would actually say that if the set of teacher manager somewhat could have happened at june 13 they would have been able to release it so i think they use it as an excuse to just wait to get it closer to eventually when the set of teacup is going to happen to have more hype because the set of teacher manager was their promotional tool nothing else besides that was announced that how would they promote this new game well it would be in front of 15,000 people in paris now that's gone okay so let's it's not a big deal if we delay it a little bit do you what do you guys think about that do you think that corona is actually the reason because the studio could not work together or do you think that maybe the Serator cup is the main reason why they don't see it as that big of a reason to actually postpone the date well, I, I mean, going into this, I, I, I do agree with you in the sense of uh, thinking it was a little bit of, a, of an excuse to use Corona for that. As if we look at it, when a lot of these places did actually end up shutting down, it's not really that much earlier than... And, like, I, I would be worried if they had that much work to do on the game by the time, you know, your your uh, lockdowns and such were imposed on... on uh, places like this. I, mean, I suppose uh, Geek, you'll know more about the situation, at least in terms of France for that. But I mean, the way I would see it, when with the lack of promotional material outside the Leon Esports uh, information, I mean, uh, the like only just in the middle of April there did we actually get our first proper trailer. I mean, it was getting to the point coming into uh, like even mid April where you could Google search, you know. Uh, or you could YouTube search, you know, a 2020 Trackmania trailer, and you wouldn't get a, there was no official trailer. One didn't exist, so it makes it makes sense to certainly delay it. But I don't believe Corona has been the 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 factor to then decide that delay. I think just with the Zerator Cup having its issues, it's allowed a little bit more breathing room for them to really polish up the game. As if they did have to release it. Uh, on May 5th, which I believe is the original date, then I I believe they could have. That that wouldn't have necessarily been the issue, but there would have been some some creases to definitely iron out. Yeah, for me, yeah, that, that's also the main feeling that I have. For me, even though coronavirus is a valid reason, it's not the only reason, in my opinion, why it was delayed. It was this, uh, of course, the um, the um, lockdown being enforced with all the restrictions, with the events uh, gathering more than 1,000 people being cancelled. And also the um, all the festivals and uh, big gatherings being uh, cancelled until September now. 
that uh, really, that uh, in my end, played a hand into the team's decision to actually postpone the game. Of course, that's the way I interpret it. And uh, in terms of actually uh, working uh, with the work from lockdown, I feel like even though they said it, they can get to uh, to a some uh, degrees of efficiency, I can relate to that, even though I never really uh, had to work from home in uh, past endeavors uh, as a web developer um, student. But uh, yeah, uh, for me, it's a com uh, coronavirus has a little bit, uh, only has a little bit of a role in that, but uh, as like the final straw. But yeah, I feel like, yeah, the cancellation of... Uh, the uh, ZRT, I, I totally agree with you on that point, Scotty, has allowed the guys you know, to actually say, all right, this time, maybe we can finally uh, get a rather uh, somewhat finished product out on uh, July 1st, and we'd rather do that than potentially try to meet a deadline by May 5th, which could potentially see, for example, uh, in, for instance, let's take the hypothetical clubs feature that would not be implemented. And whilst it actually pro big promoted aspect of the game, that would be completely catastrophic, wouldn't it? So I feel like it's not, again, as I said, uh, as you said, Zero Tour Cup is maybe the main reason with Corona playing the final straw factor. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm kind of thankful that they actually delayed it because I would rather wait a little bit more to get a finished game than to actually see the release date being met with a rushed game that would actually be uh, in the end disappointing. But do you yeah. think, um, so, Scott, you bring up that the trailer was just released two weeks before and that was essentially when they announced that there was going to be postponed it's 50 days now until the new game is out. Do you guys think that we will have more information until, let's say, when there are two weeks left again? Or will they go for the same marketing strategy, just wait and then maybe when it's one week uh, uh, left, then we will start promoting it? Well, I don't know if you can call that a marketing strategy. <laughs> <laughs> if you like it that way. But I mean, the I suppose what's... I wouldn't necessarily say the calling card in the way it's been a good thing, but historically there's always been issues between the community and Nadeo in terms of communication and what, what's happening, what can be expected, uh, what's coming up and things like that. And, and often it seems to be for a lot of their big projects, even to people who that may directly affect, uh, they don't know. They, they, I mean, the information upon... Uh, look at the Trackmania Grand League beta season as your other example. I mean, we found out about that and the qualifiers were one week after the announcement, if I remember correctly. Uh, and of course, in terms of this, is exactly what Eric was saying there. The only time we knew about a delay was two weeks before the event was coming out. And that was the only time the game had been officially announced. Uh, at least in some sort of format of which people could, you know, promote, uh, uh, you know, some sort of trailer, some sort of, you know, lovely articles. It was one of the only times that was actually done in English as well. So it it, it, go to sh it, it went to show that there was a lot of things still left to be done in that kind of side of things for me. Uh, but I, I really think that this was the best decision for them. I'm just interested to see if the communication is exactly you can ask asking there, if the communication does kind of pick up a little bit, but I'm not hopeful. I mean, I've personally uh, reached out through the private forums they've uh, they've opened with some beta testers and things like that to try and seek new information because, well, of course, the, the initial deadline has passed. We are still within two months of the game coming out and we really don't have any idea what the club's feature will actually entail. We really don't have any idea about a great deal of the the features other than what they've shown us in the initial uh, in the initial gameplay reveal, which was simply showing uh, kind of block changes, model changes, and things like that. Which I think is going to be a big point of contention for a lot of people in the scene, as there's there's one thing which is has been the question on everyone's lips with the new Trackmania getting released is the price point and. It's going to be very interesting to see how that does develop once people find out what the price point is and once we find out what kind of work has went into the game to justify whatever price point they do actually uh, they, they do actually come out with. But I mean, I, I, if you guys would at least agree with me, I think that's definitely been one of the issues that a lot of people in the community have at least been speaking quite a lot about. Yeah, that's the main big issue. Yeah, pricing and availability is essentially... Uh, I mentioned availability because in the trailer that was released a few weeks ago, before the... Uh, and at the same time that they announced the delay of the game, it was mentioned that the game would only be released on Uplay and on Epic Game Store. Now, no mention of Steam anywhere. And that actually irked some people who have some kind of reluctance 
for instance, to the uh, Epic Game Store. That's a bit of a personal preference, of course, and uh, no matter the platform, people uh, who are actually diehard fans of the game or just want to try the game, they're going to be able to pick it up. And you mentioned the clubs feature. That's actually uh, something that I really wanted to mention because, for instance, how do uh, we are uh, being taught, uh, talked about the uh, club feature as the main way to connect, for instance, teams with their fan base to actually, actually be able to have for instance, has a little club that they can actually uh, be part of and actually take part in race events and whatever and whatnot. But uh, how does it actually work? Who, uh, how can, uh, what can a club leader do? How does one create a club? How does one administrate a club on a daily, a daily basis? And the same goes for like or tournament stuff. I mean, we do get like a big tournaments, uh, a big tournaments button in the online stuff, uh, in the online menu. But it's basically doesn't really tell much. Like, of course, the big competitions are there, but what about the competitions that um, community members organize? Are we still gonna have dedicated servers, for instance, or are we gonna move to a more centralized stuff like the, we did in TM Turbo? I surely hope not. Uh, how does one register a competition that is organized so that it is actually promoted in the game to actually attract players? See, there's a whole conundrum with the uh, refactoring and sort of remodeling of the features in the game and the addition of new features that we uh, don't have any information about. And you said you weren't hopeful, uh, Scotty, about the communication side. I'm not that hopeful either, although I really like to hope that communication at Nadeo starts to pick up and maybe we can get dev blogs we're not asking for like week for like maybe uh maybe we daily reports of what the work has been going on we're not asking for like dev like uh, like deep delve uh, technical delves for instance like uh in the same way that uh, an emulator uh, like emulator teams do with uh, the change logs and whatever we're just asking for i'd say for maybe a bi-weekly report of the advancement of the features and have a little sneak preview of what each feature is uh, and uh, what each feature is about and what uh, and what the game enables you to do with said feature I feel like that would be a reasonable communication strategy to actually reassure people about the new game and get them to better transition over to the new license when it hits on July 1st then rather than actually announce it in fanfare like yay we are releasing a new game it's coming one week away and now no drop of info and people are like what really so yeah for me, it would be better to actually progressively give give uh, people breadcrumbs of information, more breadcrumbs than haven't actually been given so far, to actually ease the transition up rather than alienate the entirety of the potential TM2 community that would refuse to transition if something would uh, would not have been their way on the new game. If you have, I uh, posted on Twitter once it was like two weeks or uh, three weeks left. If anybody who was part of the beta or alpha process could talk to me about something, but they are apparently signing some sort of contract they cannot speak with me so then i reached out to ubisoft and see if i can talk with anybody there i somehow i think i had to go through some sort of communication director there but in the end i might actually get hillis back on some sort of podcast some sort of interview if you guys could ask one question or two questions what would that question be to hillis what is the most important information is it the price is it the club mode what would the one question be that's a hard one. I mean, yeah, exactly. If if I was to say that, uh, yeah, I would I would want to see, you know, what new ideas are they actually coming into the game with? Because Trackmania, well, th this new release is essentially, I mean, it's it's a re remastering, a reskinning of Stadium, whichever way you want to look at it. What new ideas are they going to bring to Stadium? How are they going to refresh how they're going to reinvent stadium to a point where uh, it's it's going to be worth whatever price point they throw at it is unless it's essentially a similar or same price point as the likes of stadium was when it released then really i i, I wouldn't I, I could understand that i mean stadium if i remember correctly was around uh, between 15 to 20 euros when it got released initially uh so i mean do they have plans there say if they're wanting to do it for 30 euros or something like that what kind of framework what kind of improvements what kind of new features can we expect that will say to someone who has paid 15 to 20 euros for trackmania 2 stadium what am i getting for this money which i cannot get in trackmania 2 stadium or what because of course with a, a very uh, well uh, spread community what can i not get as well from trackmania nations or trackmania united you know that, that's what I'd be very interested to know. What new are they going to give us, which they have not given us before? Yeah, I, I do actually join that uh, join that uh, opinion on what I on what uh, potentially the role plan the roadmap is 
part of the game because they said in the reveal at LES that it will be the only game that they will be working on in the future. Of course, many Planet is still going to get updated and whatnot, but this is going to be the main game that they're going to be focusing on, updating it with content regularly, with regular seat, with uh, regular uh, seasons, uh, campaign seasons, etc. And there's potential, although there's potentially one thing that I would love to actually take a look at. Uh, and that is from the spectator perspective. Now I'm talking here from a caster perspective. This may be a little bit different depending on the, how, uh, how you view things. Your mileage may vary, as we like to call it. But uh, yeah, I would love to see what kind of new tools uh, are actually uh, at the disposal of the, um, of the uh, video director or the caster to actually be able to, for instance, for instance, better craft storytelling or better integrate visuals with the stream. For instance, for instance, having a separate, uh, having an API sending out the um, the round scores in real time, so that it can actually be integrated in the stream and have a more um, inter uh, have feel uh, having a, a more of a complete package that anyone can actually customize. That's some bait and area that I'm really uh, wanting to actually uh, see because that's actually something that was discussed by Hylis in your interview, Idik, as he was actually pointing out as potentially uh, new camera angles or replay cameras if something that somebody had made a mistake. It would be nice to actually see what this uh, feature set is about, and I'm hoping for uh, new innovative ideas in terms of the camera, uh, in terms of the camera handling, for instance, or uh, being able to actually. Um, uh, set the HUD to your liking, a more customizable HUD rather than uh, by, by default, rather than having to go through with um, with um, server controller. Because otherwise, other than the uh, in the Barebones game, it's pretty much HUD on, HUD off. You don't have any uh, any way to customize it. It would be nice to be actually able to customize the HUD depending on your needs, whether you're gaming or casting. And uh, yeah, to get back to my question, for me, it will be spectator tools that I would really love to take a look at. My question would be uh, because they. At once this was announced, it was announced with Zerator on stage. It was announced that the new, or the last, or what do you call it, the next event for Zerator in per se with 15,000 people would actually be hosted in this new game. So, of course, that will bring a lot of promotion to this new game. Now we know that the Zerator Teacup is not going to take place in Accor Hotels Arena. We don't, probably not in 2020, hopefully in 2021. So, my question would be how do you actually promote this game to? potential new players are you just gonna be like les where you announce it there because you know that the people who showed up at that arena are fans of jackmania so that's why you give them the information well if so then how are you gonna actually reach out to other parts of the world outside france because at the moment this game is just becoming more and more french we can just go back and to another topic point about the open grand league all the players that did well there were French speakers and yeah. besides Alfie and Yamex were from France so the next generation they speak of French. Players. No, they, they're, yeah. they're not from France but they're actually speaking French in fact yeah, yeah, only yeah. Egyer is the only one that is actually a non-French speaking player to actually be uh, coming out in the top 8 and qualifying for the combine that's telling something yeah so the next generation of competitive players once the likes of Kapakal Jr Spam, Massa eventually will retire then the next generation is going to be French players. So how will you use this new game to target new uh, markets? That's something I'm looking into. Uh, if I get a question on that, I guess that's left to see. Hopefully I will get the interview uh, done in the near future. But are you guys hope hopeful about this new game? Overall positive? Could this be the a new life for Checkmania or could this eventually be the end of the competitive scene in Checkmania? I mean, I'm getting similar vibes. I mean, me and you spoke a lot about this uh, before through uh, some other podcast projects we done, Eric. I'm getting Air France Cup vibes from this. You know, so what what I mean by that, for those who maybe didn't know so much about it, we were looking, at, me and Eric were looking at the Air France Cup as being potentially a monumental, you know, event for Trackmania. Uh, and this, uh, I believe the release of Trackmania 3 would be a monumental event for Trackmania, but it can go very well or it can go very badly, completely depending on how they handle it, how, who they choose to focus their game at, how they choose to deal with the, their game, you know, uh, like exactly as Eric was talking about there, if it just simply gets focused more along the way of which it's going, as into a French audience, a French speaking audience, then the game is going to develop to being more French centric, if, if, if I can uh, make up a word there, so to speak. The game is going to become more isolated instead of being expanded more to new markets, to new regions, 
to promote more interest and, and make Trackmania into a snowball of which I believe it could become, into something which could generate international attention and could, again, snowball that attention. We've seen with Trackmania Grand League that Trackmania can approach and can uh, sign bigger sponsors to players. We've seen uh, some teams getting involved that we would have never considered uh, would be interested in Trackmania after the likes of Dignitas and Acer dropped their colours in Trackmania, after Expert dropped their colours in Trackmania, and then seeing a wave of sponsors coming in that are recognisable, teams like Space Station Gaming, Pittsburgh Knights, Veloz, who have great bases in international esports, as well as some high-tier French organisations, then it shows that Trackmania definitely has potential, but it needs to be pushed in the right direction for that potential to be realised. Through the history of how things have been handled in Trackmania, I am hesitant and I'm very concerned about it, but I would like to believe that the they are individuals that are capable of seeing what we see as well. And it's not just simply because, I mean, you can always sit on the outside and think to yourself, I would be able to do this better. I'm sure they have thought the same kind of things we are thinking, and I'd like to think there's a bigger picture that maybe, for example, I've not seen. But I'm I'm hesitant and I'm anxious, but I'm still hopeful to at least directly answer your question. Uh, to be fair, uh, I'm gonna speak, of course, from a uh, not I'm not gonna be uh, taking a time from someone who's in the side the competitive scene. I've been there for less time. I'm more of a basic. Uh, some people call it a basic B. Um, per, uh, perspective as more of a player. Of course, whenever, whenever a new game comes out or something from a uh, license that I love comes out uh, and is announced, I'm really excited to play it. But here with Trackmania, a bit of an interesting conundrum uh, comes here. I'm taking a little bit of a um, cue from chat because some people have been wondering about why don't we have microtransactions with Trackmania to keep the game free? With some suggestions, uh, for instance, uh, with skins being on the lockdown and actually uh, being proposed as a, uh, for paying for skins to actually bring revenue to the game. Well, that would be a good idea, but Trackmania is pretty much uh, is also a real content powerhouse that has been for free pretty much since the it's big since the beginning. Well, since the beginning of, uh, of Nations, if we want to be precise. But yeah, it's um, it's really one of these con uh, those uh, games that is so uh, content focused, especially on the skin department, that I feel like trying to bring a dramatic shift to the way that we see how we have to acquire skins. If we uh, shift from a, a model where most skins are available on Mania Park with a few select skinners providing high quality work, uh, with uh, paid uh, by uh, via uh, via payments, and then f from shifting from that for a fully locked down stuff with curated skins only available through Nadeo and incompatible with uh, stuff from uh, available for free from Mania Park, it feels like we're losing an entire pain of creativity of creativity on behalf of the entire community right there. Skinning has a really huge uh, huge community behind it that I do not want to lose. That's more of a specific stuff, but uh, yeah, otherwise. I'm pretty cautious, uh, a bit of more of a wait-and-see kind of thing, and I'll finish with one thing. There was this debate about microtransactions in Trackmania, and Timania, and, um, Timania makes a really good point here. Uh, in the chat, I'm taking this uh, reading uh, from the chat. The thing is that I believe the Trackmania is in a, isn't in a state to integrate good monetizing options on it, besides of maybe renting dedicated servers on Ubisoft's infrastructure, sure, but even then, that the game can't rely on it, so keeping the buy the game philosophy with keeping the same content connection as it is now would be the at the moment the only possible way and good way of doing it, even if it may suffer from less players. What's your view on this uh, particular point from Trackmania in terms of monetization model? Of course that goes back to the pricing thing, but I wanted to have your view on that before moving on to the third and final subject. I mean, well, if, if I'll have my uh, kind of part in that, with the whole monetization thing, I'm interested to hear that idea about servers. It's not really one I considered going forward. Uh, I more was looking at the, the kind of skin side of things or how they would maybe attempt to, you know, monetize like premium tournaments, uh, like say, for example, free tournaments we don't have a planet. Oh, sorry, I, uh, I clicked the wrong button, okay. 
Okay, we're back. Sorry, that was a uh, that was one, wrong episode, episode one. Episode one. Episode one. Remember, yeah, and I completely affected. I uh, window capture got broken. Really sorry. That's a, uh, that's uh that's uh the joys of uh, of uh, experimenting Useless. with new con uh, new concept. Bullshit. Absolute <laughs> yeah. bullshit. Okay, let's let, just let me re uh, recapture the uh the picture here. So hold on a second. If I'm able well, to. Well, I can continue while you, while you're sorting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, end, just then, continue. So. Just continue with your points. Sure. So uh, what, what I was saying is just basically I believe the monetization structure could be interesting in terms of, you know, uh, say for example, free tournaments with like say a planet's prize and then premium tournaments where they implement say a, a weekly cash prize or something like that mm -hmm. uh, involving people having to, you know, like say a buy-in or something like that. That's a bit more of an isolated option to the competitive scene. Skins, I completely agree with what you're saying there. That's a cool idea, but that would also shake up a fundamental part of how we view the creative side of Trackmania. But I feel that at least the most promising one would be for server rental. As as is, I mean, even just considering that straight away, it would it would seem infinitely more more viable in the sense of you look at just how many servers there are in Trackmania. It doesn't matter how many people. Are actively playing on servers and say Trackmania 2 Stadium compared to uh, Nations, as Nations tends to have at least a higher casual view, uh, play count. If, if I'm just saying that off the top of my head and without having looked into it, just on on the face of the numbers that I know of, but at the very least there is hundreds upon hundreds of servers, and it's a money making opportunity which others are taking advantage of, which could be handled by Nadeo themselves. The only part which I then would then bring into that argument is I believe Nadeo would need to up their game in terms of framework as in how they actually deal with uh, hosting a server on their end as well as, for example, there's many out there who will not only provide you server rental, but will aid you in the process of setting up server controllers, which Nadeo does not seem to have some sort of framework outside Grand League, which isn't shared with anyone else. Mm. You, If you're just to load up a, a, a base server, if you were to say, if you had the possibility of renting one from track, uh, from Nadeo directly, you've got next to no tools there uh, to allow you to, say, make any events out of it, to even track what's happening in, in the server itself. like locals and deadly times and things like that i mean we get the very bare bones of it so i think they need to bring a lot more tools to the table uh, in order for us to, and even in the skinning department they need to bring more to us to encourage people to invest in the game mm -hmm. uh, which goes back to my er earlier argument if they do end up going for a higher price point they need to justify it if they're wanting us to spend money on the game through microtransactions for servers they need to justify it. If they want us to buy in for tournaments, if they want us to pay for skins, they need to justify it with high quality content. But with the lack of communication we're getting at the moment, we really have no idea what we're going to get for the money we're going to be paying. Yeah, exactly what Scotty said out there in the end. If you want to suddenly pay for or uh, ask people to pay for something that they normally didn't pay for, like skins or something like that, then you need to add something extra or else, I guess, the more people will just stick in Checkmate Nations forever or stick to Checkmate to a stadium. Mm -hmm. So good point there from the Scottish guy. Sometimes he speaks some clever words. Yeah, it's not a side bet. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel like we've done pretty much. Uh, we feel like we've covered pretty much everything there's to say so far about the new track. Yeah, and so I know we're running a little bit late to our planned schedule. I'm really sorry about that. But episode one, boys. Episode, episode one. one. Yeah, we technical issues, uh, delayed scheduling, whatever. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's actually uh, go. Um, and let's actually go with the third and final subject. And I'm gonna leave it to Idik to actually take it away. Well, uh, my topic is a topic that somewhat got into my part of Jackmania in 2020. I didn't really plan on it. Uh, Masa asked me if I wanted to be a shot caller in Jackmania Grand League. I said, sure, I can probably help you out. Then he needed someone to cast it. I said, sure, I can probably help you out. But then I realized I cannot even uh, like capture the game. I cannot stream. So I had to ask my friend Scotty to step up. And then we got into casting, but I then figured out that I like doing it. And I thought, I think we are actually one of the first duo that have a different roles when it comes to casting. Scotty being a play-by-play -play, uh, commentator, 
that you normally have in a trip mini cast and me mm-hmm. bringing up some stats and facts and that is something i think the casting scene in trip mini should try to implement instead of just having mainly of course if you just are alone then you will do everything alone but if you are going to add someone else into the cast bring something to the table instead of just being the same sort of guy just doing each other round like okay i take round one you take round two oh now it's your round oh now it's my round so you have actually some different dynamics you have some different stuff you bring to the table i think the best example uh, to date is that uh, scotty and kappa did alongside with myself that as uh, kappa being the expert he has a unique men- uh, mentality once it comes to the game because he is uh, one of the best players and arguably the best player in Czech Mania. And then once you have Scotty being a play-by-play and mostly have to focus about what is going on in the round, you don't get that good overview that someone that just sits back and look at the round has. So that is something I think should be implemented. That is something I want to promote the more and more so Czech Mania gets a better cast experience in the end. But you are two of the casters probably going to be nominated for a caster of the year scott is nominated every year so some sort of he has a spot there every year somehow and geek stepping out this year to be probably a breakthrough caster what are you guys roles you are eventually casting it do check me and need different casting roles or are we actually can we just have one guy being everything you want to start it out scotty or can i actually start out Oh, you, you sound more than eager to get started on that, <laughs> on you go. Okay, so, yeah, I do agree with uh, with uh, what you said, um, Eirik, with the fact that uh, having separate role, having two different people having separate roles is definitely something that uh, benefits the casting experience overall. That's a feeling that's also uh, shared with uh, people in the chat. Insanity, uh, uh, Insanity, for instance, telling that he likes more the cast, uh, likes the play-by-play and Alan's combination, which feels more mat- natural, which is more akin to other esport titles and regular sports even to uh for instance motorsport which is uh one of my biggest inspirations for casting there's still there's so st- for instance there's someone play by playing and there's still an analyst that is able to actually break down for instance the technical aspect of the uh for instance of uh, tire degradation for instance or uh, being the mentality of the driver when he has to plan of an overtake that's something that's kind of lacking in trackmania trackmania has always been the odd man out when it comes to uh casting with most of the time casting being done by only one person and that one person is pretty much doing everything on its own he, he's providing the play-by-play he's providing the analysis he's doing the re, uh he's doing the, the production aspect he's uh controlling the technical side he has many different caps to wear and uh yeah in terms of uh actual depth yeah i do agree with the fact that an analyst is well and truly needed you scotty and kappa are pretty much Probably my favorite, uh, my favorite uh, combination of casters, with uh, yeah, Scotty um, uh, ensuring the play-by-play coverage, um, Kappa with the really great insights into uh, the player player's mind in terms of how you can think a potential a player can potentially bounce back from a fall, from a uh, scary situation or maybe a breakdown of maps, and uh, you, Eric, coming in with some uh, being the statistics man in uh, so to speak, uh, coming up with a few statistics. Uh, uh, for players uh, when they're entering a certain map or a certain match so yeah i feel like yeah at least play by play plus analyst would be the traditional way to go and uh, something that is somewhat missing in track mania but that is a work in progress in various languages necro <laughs> popping by and saying that it's actually a work in progress for french casters and uh yeah insanity also um uh, selling that uh, players can also help and uh yeah that is the main thing we need to rely more uh, well, rely. We need to potentially have more players step up to the plate to actually get into an analyst so that we uh, we can help out. We need to be more. Uh, of course, that's a bit of a personal thing. I'm kind of shy when it comes shy when it comes to asking for help. So I try to be as knowledgeable as I can to actually uh, uh, avoid saying too much bullshit uh, on the cast uh, when I have to talk about a certain style. The the main example for that being the um, full speed league uh, glitch edition where I was heavily trained well heavily briefed on the um rudiments of full speed and what on the which part on each key part of the map by both navi and ted from the staff and uh, yeah that really helped tremendously and for play by play analysis the best uh, example i can say was uh uh tmm with uh where i cast it with axel alex and uh alex was actually um do- providing a little bit of insight as uh, a ton of insight actually during the match as we lost uh, Idek again uh yeah, he- okay. episode one. 
Episode you 1, episode, episode 1, boys. Episode 1, we're coining it now. I'm really sorry about this. I should be coming out back any second now. There we go. So, yeah, as I said, uh, the duo was Axel, with Axel Alex was probably a, best, a good example also of a uh, play-by-play analyst working together to uh, provide uh, a bit more depth into the uh, qu uh, cast itself, but your example of yourself, Scotty, and um, Kappa is probably the best out of the bunch. Yeah, I, I would, I, I mean, it's hard for me to say when I, of course, was the one who was actually casting <laughs> We are it, the best, we are the best. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I would agree with you in the sense where it's at the very least been the most structured cast that, uh, that there's been that I've observed in Trackmania. But the one of the main problems which has resulted in this uh, issue that I would say is just simply the lack of people who are interested in stepping up, so to speak, mm. to actually be casters. The lack of people who are interested in coming in and being an expert or being a play-by-play -play commentator or being the person who'll sit in the back and do the work on the stats like uh, Eirik had done and like Kappa was the expert for the... Uh, for the, the Zero Hero stream we done. Because, I mean, in my case, I am a very well-seasoned player at this point, as well as a well-practiced caster. I can do the research myself. So I'm happy to fill in any of these sort of roles, but there's, there's, there's not as many other people out there who are going to be play-by-play -play, uh, in the case where I would then do stats or where I would be the expert to someone else doing play-by-play. -play. Of course, the other disadvantage I have being the expert for someone else's tech cast is normally I'm playing or attempting to play in the tournament <laughs> itself as well. I'm putting the attempting asterisk there for Zero Hero, of course. But, I mean, the, the problem is with that is just the lack of people who are just simply in, in, involved in the casting scene. You, at least recently, in terms of English casting, I, there'll probably be a name I'll forget, but I mean, the three main names that stick out to me in English casting would be uh, my my lovely co-partner and the uh, uh, stream today, Geek, of course, uh, my beautiful Turbo in chat. Uh, Eric, of course, steps in for some uh, events here and there, but uh, as he said, uh, more of a stats person. And th th then myself coming into that as well, the, so that's four people trying to cover essentially when there's three roles that you can fill in a Trackmania stream. Mm -hmm. Trying to have four people covering three roles and considering most times in most tournaments, you're having eight matches on at the same time. You're having four, two matches on at the same time. There's just not enough people to do it. And people naturally, at the very least at the moment, prefer doing it more individually. I mean, uh, a lot of people in some cases prefer solo cast because it has more control over their own dynamic. I mean, I've certainly been in that case, although I enjoy dual casting as much. Uh, again, it's, I suppose, different strokes for different folks, as, as they say over here. But also, one other part I would like to bring up about Trackmania and casting, which kind of causes a problem with how you would typically structure things in another esports environment. So I'll give you the, the parallel of Counter-Strike, for example. So if I'm the play-by-play -play caster for Counter-Strike, I can cast during the round, I can tell you what's happening, and uh, there's there'll be little downside, uh, the little down times in the rounds, you know, where the players are setting up, mm. where you can have the expert, you know, chip in with some parts, and, and, and things like that. And then once the round's finished, you have like say 30 seconds of a break between the next round. Uh, you, and then you have time to bring stats in, you've got time to bring analysts in, you've got time for the play-by-play -play to highlight some things they wanted to talk about. In Trackmania, you have a 50 second blitzkrieg and then, or you know, however long the round actually is, mm -hmm. going a billion miles an hour. And only and a 10 second have, pause. Yeah, you have a 10 second pause, you have the round finish timer, which is normally about five seconds and then you have three more seconds for the start. And then there you go, you're straight back in for another round. You've got five minutes, or in some cases, the maps are longer, 10 minutes before you'll actually get to breathe. You'll actually get to analyze what's happened. I mean, we had times with Eric, I wanted to bring Eric in much more to the cast and Zero Hero, but there was times where he was going 10 minutes without talking. <laughs> and, it was, and there was nothing we could do about that, you yeah. know? There's no time to get him in while I'm trying to shoehorn Kappa's information in because like you, you're just having to talk over the rounds at some point and that's something that I would I would maybe be interested in seeing something like say more spectator tools that we're bringing up earlier or just simply a competitive mode you know because from a caster's point of view you don't have the time to digest what's happening you don't have the time to talk about what's happening you know 
And then following on from that, I mean, even players, they don't have the chance to digest what's happened in the round. You know, they don't get the chance to refocus and get back into their game. Hence the pause system that was implemented mm. back in Trackmania Pro League. So, I mean, there's a lot that can be done about this in, in terms of what I was talking about with the, the casting side of things. A lot more people could get involved. Nadeo could do a lot more. So the, the, there's a question of just simply what will actually get done to uh, deal with some of these issues we're uh, seeing. Yeah, but just to bring up uh, how eventually Kappa stepped in to cast with us, he was posting on Twitter that uh, he cannot play because of his uh, wrist injury. Then I commented for fun, like, ah, oh, it's time to step in as a caster because I would love to hear him cast. And then he hit me up and like, yeah, I'm actually down to cast. So sometimes, you, Geek, you brought it up that maybe you're afraid of asking people to step in or maybe to cast. Don't be shy, just sh shoot your shot, ask people ask some players that, hey, are you able to help me out? Even though you don't want to specifically ask someone, you can post up a tweet saying, hey, I'm casting this event. Uh, is there any players that maybe want to test themselves as a caster? Myself, I would never have gotten into casting if I had to do everything alone. I am mm -hmm. I need to have a caster with me to actually stream the game, to actually do the play-by-play. -play. If I have to cast something alone, well, it's not going to be a good cast. So that's what I think the main issue is that maybe some people are too afraid to ask and once you do like solo cast in the end of a tournament you have too many casters and then it comes down to okay so who do we give the cast to ah let's don't bother let's just give two play-by-play -play guys the same grand final so it's two of the same role so hopefully tournament organization or organizers will look into this maybe ask some players specifically that maybe they have in their backup for mine because there are always going to be some great players that doesn't play the event and hopefully they have time so uh, don't be afraid to ask people to step in and shoot your shot yeah that's that's definitely something i'm gonna have to work on and that's actually something specific because that's actually something that uh yeah you brought up uh, the fact that uh, for you're having a, to have a caster with you to be able to stream the game and i feel like that's the main reason that's the main thing that put me on the map actually we did OGL uh, Step 3 casting together, Eidek, and I feel like that's really the first... Uh, the, that was our first casting experience together. And that was really uh, the first time that was actually... Uh, that was actually uh, fe feeling alive with casting, because the previous two rounds... First of all, they were in French, so nobody would have understood a thing in the <laughs> audience. And number two, I had no viewership, because nobody knew me, since uh, I... I've, even though I casted beforehand in 2019, it was Canyon stuff. So, yeah, nobody knew me at the stadium at the time, and... Uh, yeah, uh, having you on board to actually have a little bit of talk during the, uh, for instance, during the laps, uh, which is more akin to motorsports, where a play-by-play and analyst duo could actually work, uh, is definitely something, uh, something of a break. Now, I wanted to actually um, focus on something that has been uh, said by um, by one of my fellow French colleagues, Necrua, uh, saying that we as casters have a big problem with Nadeo only focusing on big streamers for events and not on casters that do have a yeah. casting pedigree. And I, we were discussing that uh, pl uh, plenty of times offline in between ourselves. And uh, we, uh, I felt like we could actually have two options for this. Uh, that's, that, I wonder uh, what your guys' views, guys on that, uh, guys' views are on that. Uh, I'm just exposing that. One, they want to keep the influencers fine, but we're bringing in an expert in the game that knows the game like the back of his hand to actually brief them on how the system works, on how certain style work, on how the transition to every key part of the track in order for them not to be complete ignorance in the game when they actually step up to the casting desk to avoid a repeat of the cast that we saw, for instance, in French at the grand finals of the uh, uh, the final phases of the Grand League with Saldos and Etoile. I have nothing against those guys, though. Uh, it's just that the casting could have done with a bit better preparation, IMO. And if that's uh, and if we uh, the second option, which would be better, is fine. They want to keep a uh, they want to keep uh, an influencer in for the uh, promotion aspect, hosting and uh, uh, general hyping of the crowd, stuff like that. Fine. And if he wants to cast, fine. But if we can actually bring someone who is actually no uh, is actually a known caster or analyst to the game to actually help the play by uh, actually handle play by play from time to time and bring analyst bits when needed. That would really elevate the um, casting uh, quality dramatically on stage. I feel like that's something that uh, that's a path that uh, Nadeo should be looking into if they want to uh, do that for uh, bigger competitions. And same goes for uh, big competition organizers. I wonder what your guys' views are on that. 
well, it's been something I've been kind of arguing <laughs> for and pushing for for years now and in terms of a lot of Trackmania competitions. I mean, I've experienced this uh, a great amount of times for offline and online events where uh, not only myself, but I've witnessed other people who have been greatly deserving of great casting work namely people like yourself geek uh, people like turbo i mean i've been in the situation myself people who are putting in supreme amounts of effort into casting and track mania but they are pushed to the side for someone who brings in a high of your count however they may bring in a high of your count but they may not be able to provide as high a quality of a cast or at least a, a broadcaster for talking about entertainment side of things mm. as well so i, I certainly believe that uh, it's 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 an injustice which a lot of small casters have had to suffer with. I mean, it's exactly Turbo's brought up there. One of the people who's getting some of the most plaudits now for casting so much and, and being such an entertaining caster in Turbo had six viewers in Trackmania Grand League. And you, would, you wouldn't even consider that when you're seeing him bringing in hundreds of viewers for Game War Duel Cup, or hundreds of viewers for the Full Speed League Glitch Edition. It just doesn't translate, and it's because so many people are getting the... So many people are being drafted into Trackmania because of the numbers they bring in. Mm. Uh, like, for example, when we look back at the, the beta season for Trackmania Grand League, instead of bringing in... A, you know, shall we say, different casters from, like, uh, say for the German side of things, contacting the old Predator crew or the Stubby TV crew or something like that, and getting, you know, people who know what they're talking about, people who have been experienced in bringing big events in German, they instead wanted to throw money at uh, Trackmania, well, a, a, a multi-style streamer who hasn't played Trackmania in years. And the same side of things, they, they contacted me personally, asking me for people who would uh, people who would be fitting to do a stream in English who had massive amounts of followers and uh, I was communicating with them about this asking it, it saying you know what what are you looking for like what kind of people are you looking for and I was trying I was uh, looking up people like say for example Jimmy Broadbent as he has uh, he brings in hundreds and hundreds of viewers and he at least has some sort of connection to racing and they're telling me oh he doesn't need to have any connection to racing and i'm like you know wh wh what do you actually want yeah want that's the main thing to, yeah do you want people to be bringing track mania to you who actually know what they know what to tell people they they know how to explain what's happening they know what to even talk about i mean it's like it, it would be like me just getting dropped into uh you know like some sort of track mania discipline like rpg like i don't understand the tricks of that I would be dropped into that. I would be able to draw upon my kind of casting experience to kind of at least bring an experience to that. But I'd still not really know what I'm talking about. So it's going to be lacking quite a big part there. So I think that big tournament organizers, so we're talking team tournaments, you know, your your big events and even smaller events need to look more to quality because that's what's mm -hmm. going to get you people coming back to your event and continuing to watch it. For example, if we're talking about just, uh, see, I'm, not that I'm calling them out for being ba uh, a bad example of this, but if you look at the, if we talk about the full speed glitch edition, if you're watching the full speed glitch edition and you've had a fantastic, fantastic time because you you you're being casted by people who know what they're talking about, who they're been successfully hyping you up about the event. You're going to want to come back to that. You're going to want. You're going to be keeping your eye out. What's the next full speed league event going to be? You know. Exactly. However, if you're just going to be seeing a, a big event coming out that's getting casted by someone that might have the hype. You know, they might have the memes. They might be I don't know shouting a lot, trying to bring the energy level up, or how, however the the method of doing it is. You you might get the kind of the euphoria from being there in the moment but you're not going to be looking back to that for the event you're going to be looking back to that for the person, for the person who is casting yeah. it so it's it's a very important thing that needs to be differentiated between that these uh that these organizers need to look at do they want people coming back to their events or do they want people coming back to these casters which a lot of people don't look at they just look you know, Virtual has 300 viewers on his stream, so we'll get 300 people watching our channel instead of Turbo, who gets 10 people when he's 
when he casted this, so, oh wait, we'll just get virtual instead. Not speaking anything to the quality of either of those two, of course, I mean, I'm not going to put my foot in my mouth there, but, like, that's not how you should be making these decisions. You should be making these decisions upon who are the best casters, not who are the most popular. Exactly, and yeah, that's something that I really, I, that's a, that's something that uh, I've been, uh, the idea in my mind, and uh, that's, a, that's an idea that I had in my mind, that of actually professionalize, well, professionalizing in quote and quote unquote to actually uh, professionalize the casting scene a bit that yeah uh, in, uh, that is to say create a pool of casters that we know are of high quality which uh, they could actually back up with casts they have done in the past for instance me I could say hey if you want a caster I am here I can do in both French and English I have casted this and this and this and this you can link a few VODs here and that's not potentially the, that's really the way of communicating that you need to have and the need and uh, need to have with organizations in order to actually be able to have a casting spot that's the pretty much the way I got uh, that uh, spot with Pittsburgh Knights that and virtual spotting the opportunity uh, linking me up to it but that's uh, big thanks for him, by the way. But uh, yeah, we feel it's just, it feels like we're still a bunch of disorganized people, uh, pretty much casting whatever we uh, whatever we can find, where we can actually come together as a group, like kind of unionize. Uh, well, unionize. You know, you kind of know what I, what I'm going for, right? Uh, assemble a group of casters that can actually be assigned to different casts depending on whatever's needs, and uh, that will be for something that would uh, be cool for the Grand League, for instance, where some of the newer organizations, for instance. Uh, the organi the American organizations such as Pittsburgh Knights or SSG have caster have had streamers that whilst they might be good they did not make the cuts in terms of uh, track when you're casting most of the time they would only stick to the POV of their player they wouldn't really go through the uh, through the race to actually uh, show people what's going on and uh, yeah that's actually kind of taking away the taking away the thing and if so, the streamer doesn't isn't entertaining enough that can, it's going to be pretty much a dead stream out of the uh, dead in the water so. Yeah, I feel like you should more emphasize on the uh, on the on the uh, caster uh, on the quality of a cast and actually bringing it forward to people and actually do more promotion of quality casts than actually rely on a, uh, personalities for uh, the celebrities uh, follower account to actually do the work for that. And we have to do and we have to uh, have the orgs to do the work for this because they have they have PR uh, they have actually PR stuff. They have PR staff uh, behind, um, um, on char in charge of the promoting stuff, marketing, social, uh, social media. They wish they should actually enable us to leverage that power to actually get a better reach, and that's something that's not difficult. And uh, that's really something that uh, kind of baffles me that we haven't really looked into. I, I'm not. I'm just gonna say I don't actually blame Nadeo in the first place for bringing in a big profile like Sardosh to cast it because obviously then he's gonna bring in a lot of viewers then you have a profile casting it but what I think Trackmania miss and that was what I was glad when I saw Riolo doing so well because then you know that he is the caster in Trackmania he was voted clearly by the community as the best caster in the game I think you should try to promote different profiles as casters so you also have people that like the game because of they doing a good cast but also feel somewhat connected to the the person because you have scotty brought up that you want people to come back just because of the gameplay but you have a lot of people that will also just come back to look at the cast look at this guy and i don't think that's a bad thing if you have a good guy doing that so you have both uh, a sort of thing by both worlds uh, and at the moment i feel like there is not a really it's just when it comes to casting, uh, I tried now to cast the game or Duo Cup, and at first I was as, well, someone else is casting that. So it's more like who is the first to ask, and that person gets the slot instead of there actually being like Geek says that maybe there is casters coming together. So it's easier to do it at the moment. If you want to cast, you need to stay on you know, on your toes and be the first one to ask. If not, you're too late. So I blame organizers there because just because someone is first you should just not say yes to them you in the end want the best caster to do it so uh, and like uh, scotty also brings up i don't think anybody should just come in to cast the grand final that just feels a little bit wrong yeah it feels off definitely feels <laughs> off <laughs> unless it's me doing it of course I, I will always be down to cast the grand final uh now i'm gonna speak on a bit of a personal uh on the personal note here uh i've never had the chance to actually go on stage and i don't know if i ever will 
But if I ever do have the chance, once uh, this whole thing gets uh, gets Akor winds Hotel down, Serena. and uh, yeah. Hotel Serena, Akor Hotel, uh, maybe not. <laughs> if I if I could pick, if, let's say let's say size down to somewhat a bit more mod uh, modest, quote unquote, because yeah, that's sure. still big for Trackmania. For instance, Gamers Assembly. If next year I was proposed to actually cast at Gamers Assembly on stage, I would put I would absolutely be down for that, even though. That would actually be, uh, even though uh, on my position, I'm not actually bringing the most uh, most viewer. But I wouldn't be worried about that if I have the PR team to back it up. That's the main thing. And I'm like, okay, I'm willing to go on to go on there. But you guys, uh, you guys are aware that I'm not here to. Uh, I can, don't really bring the big numbers, and you guys are gonna have to make the work. And uh, if they are okay with that and push the stream forward, then the reach is there and. The cast quality is there, and then it's a win-win situation because the game gets more view, gets more followers on the uh, more more followers and viewers on Twitch. The organizers for the events are going to be uh, happy with the audience numbers and happy with the turnout potentially for the years coming out. And yeah, that's just, this is something that we really need to do. And uh, yeah, that's a bit uh, end of the uh, per personal parenthesis. But yeah, if I have the chance to actually go on stage to do to do some casting, I'd be down. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly uh, agree with you in the sense, uh, Eric, what you were saying earlier, uh, latching on to the point about, you know, how casting gets split up between different people in Trackmania. As at least in, in the, the, the recent months, so to speak, I've, I've had a lot of issues with uh, casting personally. For example, when I've been doing, uh, when I've have been offered casts in some cases, I've only been offered casts of shall we say a group stage or early playoff stage whereas someone else would come in and do a grand final for example because they had a higher viewer count which is something which i mean i feel bad about being offered i mean when, when i look at that and i get offered that it makes you feel like you're not worthy of of, of such an opportunity or something like that or you, they don't believe you're worth bestowing their kind of marquee event on so to speak, uh, which also in another side of things comes with the whole first come first serve thing as well in terms of this and the sense that exactly as you said there, it's, it also seems to be with the, just the sheer amount of cups which are happening, you know, at the same time, it is very difficult to keep track of. But I mean, uh, I'm seeing people host, uh, casting and hosting cups that I've not even heard of. You know, and I've I've made it very clear through my social media that all people need to do if they're going to have me casting things, make me aware of your cup. If I if I have no idea your cup exists, I'm not going to be able to approach you to cast it. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I'm I'm one of the players who I'd like to think I know a lot about the track mania scene. I keep track of a lot of tournaments. I keep track of a lot of players. I know who's coming up and down through the scene, and still I'll see people that I'll see I'll see these casts and these tournaments coming up, and I'm like, I have no idea what's happening. You know, I've I've not got the opportunity to reach out to them and cast that. And by the time I have, you know, they've you know someone's already got their first. For example, it doesn't matter if it's you know speaking for example, sake if it was someone who was an extremely inexperienced caster, then I'm not going to get that opportunity because I wasn't there first. It wouldn't matter if I was the best caster in the world. I wouldn't get that opportunity unless I had uh, a thousand viewers, obviously, mm. as the the, the, this, the the meaning goes through here. But I think that the approach needs to change for, for to latch on to my earlier point about uh, how tournament organizers approach casters. I think one of the priorities is when I was helping manage the TMO tournament and also I helped manage the uh, Zero Hero uh, casting side of things, uh, I was then reaching out to other casters like, we need a caster, can you do it, can you do it, can you do it? Same thing with TMO, we set up and made it very clear throughout our, uh, throughout our, ent our entire reach, so to speak, that if you want to cast or you want to POV any events, here's where you do it and then we'll look at whoever has casted and whoever deserves it the most they'll get the good events they'll get the good finals like mm -hmm. we were giving it to who had streamed the most or who had put who had put the most effort into streams and that was that ended up with a little bit of uh you know choices that were unexpected going into tmo and the the people found a little bit strange i mean uh, back in the days when spam was dominating the casting world because he would just cast every grand final there was mm -hmm. uh, and then people are saying oh wait there's a grand final that's not being casted by spam so 
it, it, I would say the approach needs to change for uh, organizers and things like that, not only in terms of quality, quality over quantity, but also, it, it, I do find it a little bit hard to say this, but you need to be able to prioritize who you actually want to cast your events. So, and so say for example, I'll, as Eric was saying there, the first kind of cast with a true dynamic, I would I would say was the one with me, Kappa, and uh, Eric that I was aware of at the very least. I mean, people might have done it before. I'm not entirely aware. But if we are going to be able to cast that event and we're going to be able to bring you the best experience, not saying that we would bring the best experience over some other duo or trio or whatever, but just for example's sake, then organizers need to at least have a little bit of kind of stomach to basically say to other people who have been there first, look, thank you very much for getting in touch with us, but we believe these other people would be a better choice because they bring this, they bring that, they've, they've got an analyst with them, they've got, you know, they've, like, we had a world champion fucking mm -hmm. doing, doing, <laughs> doing the, like, doing we the... We have the Grand Lake Beta but... Season champion with with, the, uh, we, with them, and we prefer exactly. to actually choose them. And I say that almost hesitantly because I realize that's going to result in some very, very good casters not getting opportunities which they should have. Mm -hmm. Like, say for example, I'm kind of lucky in my sense where I've been around the top level tech scene for quite a time. I've also socialized with these people. I find it much more easier to approach them. They know me, they find they would be more comfortable in talking to me, uh, even working with me in the sense where, for example, I wouldn't have trouble asking Kappa about, you know, say, uh, would you like to get involved in this tournament? Because I've spoke to Kappa before, I've interacted with him. Whereas some other people in the case of uh, people like uh, Geek who uh, was saying it was nervous and in some cases approaching people, but also in the sense where, on the other side of things, say you're speaking to a, a big player, a you know, world champion or something like that, they might just be like, I don't know who you are, you know, or say I asked them and someone else didn't, then they would be more likely to go for me because they know me, not because I'm a better caster, not because it's good, they're going to be able to work with me better in a sense of things. So I think it's going to lead to some hard choices for some tournament organizers if they do go down that route. Uh, it's going to be some hard choices for sure. But uh, it's going to lead to a better product overall. It is going to lead to some people being a little bit unhappy, some people getting left out of some casting, uh, some people not getting chances that they would deserve. But it's it's a question of do we really want these casts to be as best as they can be, or are we going to go the easy way and have two play-by-play -play casters doing one round at a time? You know that that's mm. not the best solution. So there definitely needs to be an answer to that. Okay, uh, do you have any points uh, on, the, on the final point of view, potentially, Eric, before we finally close the show? Well, I just... If you just talk about the smaller cups, then I think it's down to the organizers to yeah. sort out who is eventually going to cast it and why they should cast it. From Zero to Hero, I was... We, we came in pretty late, me, Kappa, and Scotty, so we only got to cast some matches, but at least we got to cast some winner bracket matches, so I'm happy about that, but... Uh, they told that because Turbo and uh, Xenos cast everything, mm -hmm. they are deserved of a grand final, and I agree with that. But I just want to point out that casters in Checkmania, they don't should. It sounds maybe wrong, but they don't. They sh should not expect that everybody that comes into the scenes know about them. That was the problem yeah. I had, or not the problem I had in the start, but a problem that I saw in the start once there were so many new organizations coming into Checkmania because of Checkmania Grand League, and they still had this. Uh, profile from their own organization casting it and then i reach out personally to those orgs and asking do you want some jackmania casters and they said of course but nobody has his up and then i asked jackmania casters have you are you going to cast jackmania grand league and they say no nobody has asked me if you want to cast something ask about it because there are big chances to get to cast jackmania grand league that's essentially how geek it got so popular now that you got the pittsburgh spot you are now probably the front runner for caster of the year Scotty casting for big and uh, so this is a big opportunity if you want to essentially later on live from casting in Jackmania so just because you are a Jackmania cast and just because you're Czech casting some big tournaments don't expect everybody who comes into Jackmania to see okay uh, I'm gonna do a lot of research and maybe I find out who is casting put your name out there put some tweet out there that you're down to casting hit them up in DMs 
just do whatever you can to promote yourself once the big opportunities like this comes around. And it's not going to be long until the next one because there's going to be new organizations coming in for Checkmania Grand League Season 2. So sure. be ready to hit them up in DMs. I'm certainly going to do so and see what maybe I can benefit from it. Maybe earn some money from it so I can be longer in Checkmania for the future. Yeah, I'm probably going to do the same thing as well. I'm definitely on the lookout if there's going to be any more me, me. Who's that... faster in hitting people in the DMs? Yeah, well, I feel like I'm, <laughs> it's going to be a losing battle for me at this point. But uh, yeah, Nikola actually making a, uh, a good point. Mentioning, mentioning uh, a uh, caster organization covering the game, uh, covering the Grand League. Uh, he mentioned the, the uh, example of O Gaming, which is a really popular French organization that has channels for per game that has a crew of casters for League of Legends covering LES, uh, not covering LEC, uh, LPL and stuff like that. And yes, that would be cool, but I don't know if, I don't really know if, uh, if Nadeo would really agree with that. I don't know if they've even talked to All Gaming about the whole thing, and I don't know, even know if All Gaming are interested. That's something that uh, is basically down to Nadeo and All Gaming discussing, hey, do we want to uh, discussing in, uh, into this kind of thing? And I feel like, I know this may be, it might be a bit of an unpopular opinion, but for me, having a hybrid of per player cast per player povs during the regular season is something that uh, and um a unified cast one in fresh one in english for the playoffs phase is much better is a uh, for me a good compromise for uh compared to what we saw for instance in uh, between the beta season and the inaugural season in the inaugural season we've had player casts we've had uh, a stream for um for instance we had ceramic streaming for orel we had luti Casting for Papu, we had uh, Wax and Shap uh, casting for Carl Jr. We had myself casting for Pittsburgh at one point. We had yourself and uh, we had uh, both of you two casting for Masa and so on. And the thing is, that system was through throughout the entire season. And while it did allow for uh, some people to actually get their hand into casting, get their hands dirty, um, the fact of keeping the player casts and uh, keeping organizations free to cast uh, whatever they want during the playoffs. It's definitely not uh, not healthy because I actually sent this into a feedback email to Nadeo actually after the Grand League was over. Um, it just turned into a popularity contest. For instance, Virtual, which who is a grip caster by the way, I casted with him on Combine. He was awesome, but Virtual was definitely the most watched streamer, say uh, streaming the playoffs phase on stage compared to uh, he. I think he had around forty to fifty percent uh, more views than all the other English streamers combined. That is that of Sinas on Spam, which bring, uh, brought in the second and most amount of viewers than myself, and then Cousin on Veloce. So yeah, I think a hybrid of these two would be a good compromise with the pool of casters in the English section um, feeling on duty for the uh, French cast. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I wonder what's going to be your view on that. After that, we're close the show, I promise. Get an official cast for uh, the next season of Track Mini Grand League, 100%. Get the... Then you can, then actually Softy B can handpick who he wants to cast. He can uh, handpick who, what roles he wants. And then Nadeo and Ubisoft can then promote that stream. And if different orgs want to promote the official stream or if they want to promote their own POV, then you have that. But easy fix, just get an official cast for the biggest competition and the most prestigious one in uh, Track Mini Grand League. I would I would agree that there does need to be an official cast for TMGL because having essentially what would have been the perfect storm for them would be having 16 casts of the same event and of course in the playoffs it was a joke when you had four casts of the exact same uh, you know the exact same screen because it was coming from a and clean in feed. the exact same language it just becomes a mess yeah yeah exactly it's it's it was too oversaturated in terms of casting for that and it just felt like it was just too much uh it was just too much want for quantity you know they wanted numbers they wanted to be able to say oh this many people were watching track mania at the same time whereas the 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 quality all across the board wasn't as good as it could have been just because the efforts weren't consolidated behind one person i mean look back at the track mania pro league when we, uh, when we had packages, when we had thumbnails that were all coming from the organizer themselves because it, th there, was, there, was a, there was a big effort behind it. Whereas you didn't have that in Trackmania Grand League, that was all behind orcs, some will do it, some won't. Um, yeah, you also, pretty much had to DIY their whole way through the entire graphics package. That's pretty much what I've been yeah. doing. Yeah, it, exactly. That, that was quite a, a big problem with that. But while I would like a, a official cast for the next seasons of Trackmania Grand League, one of the main problems i think with that is the approach they've taken to official casts previously 
Whereas uh, in, in previous occasions, when, uh, for example, if I'll, if I'll give Softy as an example, through Pro League and through, uh, well, Pro League specifically, if I'm giving Softy as the example, in the sense where it was prioritised to people who were the more popular caster, is of course not just giving anybody a chance, but casters that were more popular or more favoured, uh, and, and in the sense of just lo looking at a very, a very minute limitation there. But then transitioning into Trackmania Grand League, I, I don't know who's in charge of Trackmania Grand League, and I will also put the TMPL thing with an asterisk of I did not have the internal information on that. It was more seen that the people who got to stream Trackmania Grand League were just simply people with higher numbers more than anything else. But uh, I digress. Going back onto the Trackmania Grand League side of things, as I was exactly saying through the beta season, the only streamers they were interested in was people who brought in a lot of numbers. And the, the the people who they were throwing their weight behind in the playoffs were the people who had the most numbers. It wasn't the best casters. So do I really want them to take the same approach for season two? Um, I don't know if I'd rather watch one of, shall we say, five English casts, knowing that one of them is going to be great, although it may have less viewers, than having one cast, which is all right, that has a thousand viewers you know I'm, I'm not really sure which one of those i'd prefer so i'd like to see them uh i'd like to see them taking the kind of approach we're suggesting and doing that doing taking that sort of approach and having an official cast but something's telling me we're not going to get uh, the best of both worlds in that case all right i feel like we've covered pretty much everything there is to say about the cast about the, <laughs> how to improve casting on tm they, they, see this is the kind of broad topics that we like that we uh, potentially are going to cover on this show and uh yeah uh there was uh, a question by um smooth i think it was uh saying if there is any kind of uh, planning of uh doing the let's talk track mania on a regular basis and uh i feel like uh do you reckon we could do this weekly for, for uh well let's uh ask scotty about that because <laughs> scotty is the most busy guy once it comes to late evenings let's be honest i could talk about Jack Mania every day but i hope this is going to be a weekly talk show but let's give the word to scotty when is the next episode oh, well i've put my tuesdays by so that's all on you guys i've told you my <laughs> tuesdays have been reserved the schedule's been marked on work. They know better now. They ain't gonna fuck with us. Uh, also, we got a, a Nukra suggested potentially a monthly rhythm, or maybe we could go for a compromise and bi weekly, but whatever. It's gonna be. We're gonna do this weekly. Every Tuesday is this plan. And if it doesn't work out, let's be honest, we could do another show where you talk about the recap of 2020, the new Jack Mania and casting. So there's always stuff to talk about. But I think we will try it out weekly on Tuesdays for now. And if the interest is gonna drop down and see that we should maybe do it less maybe do it uh, even more then we're gonna see what the community thinks about that but for now i think it's gonna be a weekly project and i said it to you guys before this every episode is gonna be one percent better yeah and uh yeah you very doc you're mentioning that if it is weekly then it must be shorter remember this is episode one and we went way off the schedule we were we, we had recap 2020 as a topic we could have talked for three hours about yeah we could have yeah, yeah i'll try to condense it as much as possible and it's still <laughs> overrun by a few minutes and i'm really sorry about that but then we went on to casting and oh boy boy yeah. we went wild wow well, to the wild wild west through there but anyways it is uh well it is and yeah <laughs> it is it is 20 it is almost 20 to 11 in in your uh, in france right here so i feel like it's um yeah there's still more to be said as well so yeah i feel like we can split this into multiple weekly uh weekly uh shows like this so yeah expect more let's talk track in the future starting next week so yeah i feel like that's pretty much it for this first show any final words you guys got any questions from chat though because i actually said that we will do that in the end oh yeah so i have enough. this one question but uh, I can bring up, once we talk about the new Jack Mania, we mainly talk about the esports side. Do you have any short wish about what other aspects of the game will grow the most? Is there any aspects of the game that you will follow more closely? Myself, I will mainly focus about the esports side and how it comes to competition, so I don't have a strong wish in there. Uh, me neither. To be fair, I don't really have much. I, I don't really. W I have one standout thing that I really want to see. I'm just really looking forward to play the game, 
and actually uh, take a look at the, uh, the, the season campaign and stuff like that to actually see potentially some more some uh, new uh, some new campaign tracks because I to be fair I've played the uh, I kind of played the uh, the uh, campaign tracks of both of of uh, TMN SWC TMNF and TM2 Stadium to death so yeah I'm just waiting for for the brand new campaigns and the new concept of seasonal campaigns to come out and uh, actually to get that out of the world. Mm. Oh, just a, a final thing from a, a question I got in the chat as well from our very own uh, Luckers Turbo and uh, well, well, I'm not sure if this is the direction that we will we will go into with this, I, I, I suppose this is something best discussed uh, later on, but uh, he was asking how he could become involved in this Let's Talk Track Mania uh, project. I would encourage anyone who is interested involved, regardless of what, what way we decide to go with this, if it will just be the three of us, regardless, that decision, I believe, is still to be made. So if you are interested in being part of this project, if you feel like you've got a big area of track mania, which you specialize in, like, say, some who are, uh, they've got a lot to talk about, about United, for example, mm. maybe, because that was, of course, a nominee for Story of the Year, if I do if I do recall correctly. Yep, was yep, exactly. United. If you feel you have a big topic, you have a lot to say, get in touch with us. Uh, all of our social media links will be available in our respective streams. So get in touch with us, contact us on Discord if you're interested in uh, telling us what you have to say. Yeah, just shoot your shot, but I think for now it will be the three of us, but feel free to hit us up with topics. I mean, if you want to be a guest and talk about Jackmania, I have my own Jackmania podcast where I allow people to speak. Scotty has his ESAC podcast where he can invite different people. So my idea about this is that every time you tune in, you know that it's going to be the three of us speaking together. So you kind of get to know ourselves better. So we, and the dynamic here is good. So we are not afraid to say if we disagree with someone. When, while if you talk with someone for the first time, you are going to sit in back and, am I going to hurt this guy's feeling if I say it's wrong? I don't care if I hurt Scotty's feelings anymore after I, after I left him in Lillehammer to die. Uh, okay, so two final questions here uh, from my chat. After that, we're going to be going offline. Uh, the first one is coming from SRK. What could be the things that could attract the American or Asian scene into Trackmania? That's something that's uh, that's a little bit interesting. <laughs> that's because a topic for that's next a time. That's, that's too a topic big, man. for that's a topic for another day because there is a lot of things that we could uh, could do. And another thing related to well, coming back to the casting theme, cast question from Necro. Uh, what do you think? Uh, um, uh, do you think that uh, Twitch could actually have Trackmania in uh, the esport category anytime soon? Do you think that this could be a real possibility? It can, but I probably won't. My bet. Okay. You're you, you Scotty, <laughs> on this? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree. It can be, but I don't. Th I don't think that's. I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference, to be honest. Alrighty then, and on that bombshell, as someone would say, it's time to end. So this has been the very first episode of Let's Talk Track Mania. We went way over time. We had a bunch of uh, technical issues, including a misclick on my part. That was me, fat finger, it bullshit and useless. Uh, but anyways, we hope you've enjoyed the show, and uh, yeah, I hope you guys uh, are looking forward to seeing more uh, talk shows like this uh, coming in the next few weeks from us, from the three of us, and. Uh, yeah, this has been pretty much it. Uh, thank you very much, Eirik, and thank you very much, Skalti, for joining me uh, on this uh, on the beginning of this new journey. And uh, yeah. By the way, if people have feedback, hit us up. This is the first episode. How do you want to, this format to be better? I think everybody's going to agree that this should be shorter. That was we we plan to have yeah. every topic for 15 minutes, but it's going to be the first episode, so it's obviously going to pick some big topics like recap and then a new Jackmania. But in the end, this is going to be around 45 minutes, one hour. So if you tune in next Tuesday, don't expect to be here for uh, two hours. And uh, yeah, like I said, hit us up with feedbacks. Alrighty then. So for this, this has been Eide Kolbel, Scotsman, and Thomas Mengozi, aka G Geek. And we'll see you next time. Godspeed, people. See ya. See ya.